Hey, good evening and welcome to Calvary. So glad you could join us for our evening service. We are continuing our study through uh, the book of Job. Last week we did two chapters, tonight only one. Job chapter 27, tonight we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 23, in a message that if we were to break this portion of Job's speech down, it's a message about the righteous and the wicked. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just like the song says and just like we sang, What a privilege that we can carry everything to you in prayer. And Heavenly Father, we know that the fervent, effectual prayers of righteous men and women really matter. And Lord, we know that we live in a broken world. Uh, We live in a difficult world. We know that people face fresh challenges. The loss of a loved one, the loss of a job. Heavenly Father, we know that many people are facing great difficulties. And Heavenly Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would provide strength and courage. Lord, we pray that you would reinforce not only our confidence and trust in you, but that, Lord, we will trust you, rely on you, cling to you. Even as we study this book of Job, Lord, we pray that we would grow in sensitivity in compassion, grace, and mercy, all the while pointing people to our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Job chapter 27. I'm going to read the first six verses. It says, moreover, Job continued his discourse. It carries over, of course, from chapter 26. He continues his discourse and said, as God lives, who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God in my nostrils, My lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say, you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. In chapter 26... All the way to chapter 31, Job is going to give an extended speech, a long and complicated defense before his friends. In chapter 26, Job began his defense by reminding his friends that they hadn't been very helpful, you'll remember, in verses 1 through 4. And He explored the wonder of God's creation, pointing out that if you consider the sun and the moon and the stars and the universe, you're only beginning to scratch the majesty, the power, the magnificence of God, the work of God. We might think of it this way, even creation itself is just a minor hint at the wonder and the glory of God's great power. Now in this chapter, Job's going to maintain his innocence or righteousness in verses 1 through 6. Later, he's going to pronounce a curse on his enemies, warning them that they would be punished like the wicked in verses 7 through 12. And then Job outlines and describes the fate that is reserved for the wicked in verses 13 through 23. And again, even as he makes that description, it becomes a type and a picture of a future judgment that is certainly going to come. And so we live in a world 
where vocabulary comes and vocabulary goes, there's certain words that are in fashion and there's certain words that quickly go out of fashion, like righteousness, like wickedness, like suffering. And when you hear about righteousness and you hear about wickedness, you hear about suffering, you hear about judgment, it can sort of weigh on you. It can sort of get to you. Particularly when you talk about righteousness and wickedness because it sounds so judgmental. But the truth is, the Bible has a great deal to say about righteousness and wickedness. And when the Bible uses the term righteousness, depending on the context, it typically means what it means to be right with God. And when it speaks of wickedness, it means in opposition or rebellion to God. On my radio program today, I, I had an unusual call, one that I don't ever remember getting, at least in this specific question. I've certainly been asked the question about the wicked and the righteous, but the caller called in and, and quoted Psalm chapter 11, how the Lord... Well, I'll, I'll read it. Let's see if I can find it. Psalm chapter 11. He, he asked the question... I didn't plan to go there, but now I am going to go there. In Psalm chapter 11, I think in verse 5, yes, it says this. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be um, the portion of their cup. He then talked about John 3.16 and it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. So which is it? Does God love the wicked or does he love the world? And the right answer is God hates wickedness. And the truth is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The truth is that people in rebellion and disobedience to God, there is a mechanism, a mechanism of forgiveness and release, of redemption and reconciliation. So both are true. And so it prompts a question. How would you describe your life? How would you describe your thinking? How would you describe your personal conduct? Is your conversation marked by cursing or kindness, self-control or anger? Do you protect people's property or do you steal their property? Do you shirk labor or do you put in a fair day's labor for a fair day's wage? Do you show respect or disrespect? Do you tear people down or do you build them up? Do you abuse the people closest to you or do you demonstrate love and attention and affection? Do you ignore the needs of others or do you only live to satisfy yourself? The Bible uses words like righteousness, wickedness, and when it's using those words, it isn't just a theological term that's supposed to prompt a theological response. It's an invitation of a description of the way you think and act. And so Job has faced the pressure from his friends to repent of sins that he's never committed, to abandon wickedness which he's never embraced, And so Job maintains his innocence. Job refuses to repent of sins or crimes that he's never committed. F.B. Myers wrote, quote, The child of God is often called to suffer because there is nothing that will convince onlooker, onlookers of the reality and power of true religion as suffering will do when it is born with Christian fortitude, unquote. In other words, there's very few things that will awaken in the hearts and minds of people as when they look at you, when they look at you facing problems, when they look at you facing pain, when they look at you facing 
difficulties. It was Mac Douglas who said, quote, don't be like the boy during World War II who said, I wouldn't mind going to war and being a hero if I knew I wouldn't get hurt. You want to go out and you want to have an adventure, but you don't want anything bad to happen. And, and you might use that same expression. Well, you know, I, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want anything like's happened to Job to happen to me. I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a committed Christian. But I don't want to have to run the risk that God might dis discipline me. So many Christians want to join Abraham and Isaac and Joseph and Job in the hall of faith. Job's friends have not proved their case against Job. Remember what their accusation is. The reason why you're suffering all of the things that you're suffering is because there's something wrong with you. Something must have gone terribly wrong with you. And Job himself still hasn't found the answer to his question. And remember what his question is? Why me? I've said everything right and I've done everything right and I've loved God and I've, I've, I've worshipped the Lord and I've, I've loved my children and I've cared about the poor. I've tried to provide justice for those who have been taken advantage of. Job is asking the question of why is this happening to me? He continues on his journey. What is really remarkable is that his faith remains intact. Job will maintain his honesty, his integrity, his commitment, his righteousness, if you will. And so in verse 1, it says, moreover, Job continued his discourse and said, as God lives, who has taken away my justice and the Almighty, who has made my soul bitter. Job placed his confidence and faith in the true and living God. And Job has made every effort to live a life of faith. He continues to be in the trash heap. He continues to be suffering. He was living a life of profound grief and sorrow. Remember, he's still mourning the death of his children. He's still overcome by the loss of his wealth and possessions. And it would also appear that he has a debilitating disease, an illness so painful and so difficult that it keeps him just literally moments away from death. You'll remember at the beginning of the book, his wife has rejected him. She's already said, curse God and die. He was apparently expelled from the community where he lived. How do we know that? Because he's living on a trash heap. Job couldn't grasp why in the world would God allow such a series of disasters, calamities, tragedies. It all seemed so unfair. It all seemed so unkind. After all, Job was a true believer. He trusted the Lord with his whole heart. He worshiped the Lord with real affection and dedication. He wanted to please God. He wanted to live righteously. Why in the world would God allow Job to bear such pain, such suffering, such humiliation? How could God allow Job to live like a homeless, destitute person foraging for food on the city's dump. It made no sense to him. It seemed completely unmerited. And remember, Job's friends, they have trouble understanding. How is this even possible? A righteous man, a true believer, how could he suffer so much to bear that kind of burden was hard to accept. And so the friends, remember, the friends are completely convinced he must be guilty of something. Something. He must have done something wrong. And if Job was guilty of some serious, grievous sin, the only chance, the only chance that Job had was to confess his sin and to turn to God. I'm going to suggest to you, as I've suggested throughout this, that are his friends insensitive? Yes. 
Are they lacking in wisdom? Yes. Are they in great need of a sensitivity and compassionate training? Yes. But I'm going to suggest to you that they really care for Job. And that's why they keep hounding him. That's why they keep preaching the same message, to confess and repent. Despite all the pressure, Job maintains his innocence. And so Job takes an oath. He swears by God. When he says, as God lives, who has taken away my justice and the Almighty, who has made my soul bitter as long as my breath is in me and the breath of God in my nostrils. In the ancient world, he takes an oath by God and he takes an oath by his own life. It's, it, it, it's his way of saying, I swear by the living God. And I swear on my own life that I'm innocent. And in the ancient world of the Middle East, an oath was intended to do th two things. It was intended to set aside any doubt. And it was also an invitation for God to kill you if you're lying. So it's not like our culture and society where a person looks you in the face and says, I swear to God. And you, you, you go, you don't, you don't have to do that. No, no, really, I'm telling the truth like you weren't before. No, this time I really am. In the Middle East, when they would swear to God, like I said, they were in effect taking an oath and saying, if I am not telling the truth, May God take my life. As long as my breath is in me and the breath of God is in my nostrils, I will not speak wickedness, more to my tongue to utter deceit. The point of it is to put to rest the nagging charges and accusations. It's, it's Job's way of saying, guess what? You don't have to keep accusing me of things that I haven't done. My lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. Far be it from me that I should say, you are right. Till I die, I will not put my integrity away from me. This is Job's way of saying, look, if I agreed with you about this, then we would both be wrong. He's not going to say, you're right, just to make them happy or in the hopes that they'll go away. Job refuses to lie in verse 4. He refuses to deny or compromise his righteous life. And he says, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? I am going to my grave, maintaining my innocence. I refuse to lie to God. And I refuse to lie to myself. I saw an interesting quote the other day on TV. <laughs> it was Seinfeld. George Costanza said, Jerry, just remember, it's, it's, it's not a lie if you believe it. See, you're laughing because you understand the ridiculousness of that statement. Jerry, it's not a lie if you really believe it. Does Job really believe it? The answer is yes. Does God even believe it? Remember at the opening of the, of, of the passages, remember Job's God, the Lord God himself says, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him. I think that there are two things that we say to ourselves. We, we try to have a conversation that's true, but sometimes we have a conversation that isn't so true. On my radio program just a few days ago, I had Tim Irwin on. He's written a book called Impact, and there's a chapter in his book entitled Lies That Leaders Love. And I was fascinated by the chapter. The list included... These are some of the lies. When a leader tells himself or herself, I'm the smartest person in the room. I'm more important than anyone else. 
I have the keenest insight. I know better than anyone else. The company should implement my ideas without even questioning me. Although there are some good doers on the team, I'm the best thinker. My judgment about matters is what matters most. And so in this book, he talks about in the real world in which people live who hold the deep convictions that they're that important, they... They stimulate and encourage arrogance and impatience and dismissiveness. He writes, how do we deal with such ingrained and deeply rooted beliefs? Tim Irwin writes, we have to submit that the beliefs are not true and then we have to substitute the beliefs with what is true. He writes, every person has an important role and they can make a valuable contribution. There's insight and perspective that requires respect from each person. That we offer insight, but we do so with humility. And we sometimes don't have all of the facts. And sometimes we don't have all of the information. And sometimes we need to allow our ideas and opinions to be challenged. And remember what we've always said. Can you imagine if Job and his friends could just simply have access to what you already know in the first two chapters? Can you imagine if everyone in your family and all of your friends could have access to the understanding about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Can you imagine if each and every person that you knew could just have a glimpse, a tiny glimpse, not a big glimpse, not even a a long extended glimpse, but can you imagine if each and every person could just get an idea of what it would be like to spend eternity in hell or heaven? If they could know the radical consequences of sin and the terrible, terrible reality that happens when people refuse to reject their sin and they they refuse to embrace the Savior. And so Job says in verse 6, my righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me. This is an idiomatic expression, a poetic way of saying, look, I want to live my life righteously and I want to live with a clear conscience. That's what he means. I want to live with a clear conscience with the time that I have left. And so it continues with Job's warning, a curse on false Accusers In verses 7 through 12, it says, May my enemy be like the wicked, and he who rises up against me like the unrighteous. Pause for just a minute. Who or what are Job's enemies? Who are his enemies? Remember those who have stolen his property and possessions in chapter 1, verses 13 and, and, and through 17. If someone comes and steals everything you own, are they your enemy? Yeah, I think that that's a good candidate. What about those who mocked him because of his horrible and terrible condition in chapter 12, verse 4? The thieves who took everything that he had, the people who lived in unrelenting mocking. Theft and abuse are bad. But imagine stealing from the poor. Imagine abusing those people who are the most vulnerable. The Expositor's Bible has this little comment. It says, quote, Job's oath is followed by the implications against his detractors in verse 7. Imprecatory rhetoric is difficult for a Western mind to understand. You may not even know what imprecatory means, but it's those, those statements that are made here in, the, in Job and elsewhere in the book of Psalms where David says something like, Lord, smash my enemy's head, pound them in the mouth, break their teeth. It's sort of like a Sicilian prayer. Break their arms and their legs. May they be found on the ditch somewhere along the side of the road. And we don't always understand that. You know, you, you, look, you read Job and you read the book of Psalms and you go, wow, that doesn't sound very Christianly. 
Remember in the book of Job, there's no Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy. There's no giving of the Mosaic law. And Jesus hasn't spoken the Sermon on the Mount. He writes, the implication had a judicial function. It says, in the Semitic world, that means in the world of the Middle East, it was an honorable rhetorical device. The implication had a judicial function and was a frequently a means of dealing with false accusations and oppression. Legally, the false accusations and the very crimes committed were called down on the perpetrator's head. Since the counselors had falsely accused Job of being wicked... They deserve to be punished like the wicked, unquote. And so when the giving of the law finally does come, if you falsely accuse of murder, then you ran the risk of being put to death. If you falsely accused someone of adultery, then you could be put to death. If you falsely accused people of stealing something, you, whatever the punishment was, you could face the consequences. Can you imagine living in a world where every time you went to court, you put your hand on the Bible, you raised your right hand and said, I swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And if I'm lying, I will receive the sentence of the accused. That's what it's talking about. In other words, they're taking the charges seriously. In verse 8 it says, For what is the hope of the hypocrite? Though he may gain much, if God takes away his life, will God hear his cry when trouble comes upon him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call on God? Verse 11, I will teach you about the hand of God. What is with the Almighty? I will not conceal. The NIV says, I will teach you about the power of God. Verse 12, it says, Surely all you have seen it. Why then do you behave with complete nonsense at the end of verse 12? Here's what Job is saying. The wicked have no hope when they die in verse 8. The Lord will take their life. All hope vanishes away. In other words, it's, it's, it's Job's way of saying, Hey, look, when you're dead, all chances to change are discontinued. Someone used to sing a song, time is a gift of love and grace. Without time, there would be no time to change. You're given a day, you're given a week, you're given a month, you're given a year, you're given an amount of time. But death resolves all things. When death comes, there's no time for change. There's no time for optimism. There's no time for faith. And all, all hope vanishes away. And then number two, the wicked suffer problems. They, they cry out to God in prayer. But God has no obligation to answer them in verse 9. Will God hear his cry when trouble comes upon him? The implication being the wicked, the wicked, the wicked live in a sweet oblivion to the demands of God and God's commands. The people who live apart from God, apart from Christ, apart from the, the Bible, they don't want to have anything to do with God. They don't want to have anything to do with church. They don't want to have anything to do with prayer. They don't want to have anything to do with righteousness or, or, or holiness. And so the wicked live in a world where they go, you know what, I'm not a religious person. I'm not a you know, I'm not a church person. I'm not a Bible reading kind of person. But when the disaster strikes, when the calamity occurs, when the storm blows, when the sick, it, when the wicked suffer, sometimes the wicked will say, Lord, I need you. And what Job is pointing out is, well, wait a minute. You've lived your life like you don't want to have any part of God. And then when disaster strikes, you want God to show up. But the Lord doesn't necessarily listen. Why? The answer is clear. 
The wicked never trusted God. The wicked never sought to please God. They never sought to obey God. So imagine, imagine a person who never sought to, they they don't seek God. They don't love God. They don't embrace God. They don't want to please God. They don't want to obey God. And then tragedy occurs and they go, okay, Lord, now I'm ready. Now I want to talk about it. And number three, the wicked find no pleasure. They find no joy. They find no comfort. They find no satisfaction in the living God. And so rarely, if ever, will they cry out to him. In verse 10, when it says, will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he always call on God? The picture is the picture of the wicked who says, you know what? They don't have any pleasure in God. They don't have any joy in God. They don't have any comfort in God. They don't have any satisfaction in God. And so it doesn't make sense to them to cry out to God or have an intimate relationship or a personal connection with God. They live in their own selfish world. They don't want to honor. They don't want to worship God. Their joy and satisfaction comes from doing what they want. From from following their own pleasures. Seeking their own way, accumulating wealth or the experience of pleasure. The presence of God and the worship of God isn't a part of their world. They've abandoned God for the passing pleasures of this life. And so in verses 11 and 12 when he says, I'll teach you about the hand of God. What is with the Almighty I will not conceal or the power of God. Surely all you have seen it. Why then do you behave or why then do you behave with complete nonsense? In in other words, this is Job's way of saying the wicked fail to see God's power. In what way? The wicked fail to see God's power In creation. In what way? They see a sun. They see a moon. They see stars. They see the mountains. They see the rocks and the trees. The birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees. And the thing called love. Okay, different. Sort of got off their track here for just a second. They see the world. They see all that God has done in the universe. They understand and are taught about the power and the majesty of God. They consider the universe in which that he has made. And then they pretend like it never happened. If you have watched the Cosmos series like me with Neil deGrasse Tyson, he reiterates his mentor's words. The universe is all there is and all there ever was. You look at the universe, the majesty of the universe, and then you come to the conclusion, it just sort of happened. Okay, explain to me again how it just sort of happened. Well, you know, a a tiny, at, at the atomic level, a mass of energy the size of an atom all of a sudden explodes and creates all of the matter and energy that it appears in the universe. And then in the cooling of the star system, Stars form and planets form and then they throw off gases and and chemicals and minerals and these things go from a sort of globular kind of a thing and then hydrogen combines with oxygen which forms water and then water is struck by lightning and somehow becomes living things and the living things eventually turn into you. And they say, and I know that sounds crazy. But the universe and everything in it exists probably apart from God. When you suggest that God made the universe, when you suggest that God made man, when you suggest that God sent a message in the person of Jesus Christ to die on a cross and then rise from the dead, they think you're a complete idiot. Job points out that the wicked almost always get everything that God does wrong. God made the universe. God made you. God made a way of salvation. And Job offers proof. 
the proof that Job offers that his friends have misinterpreted, they've misunderstood the God of the universe and the ways of God. And the evidence that he offers is by their complete misunderstanding of both God and Job's condition. And he shows a special insight that we should each pay very, very close attention to. Because if you misunderstand this world and you misunderstand the people in the world, if you misunderstand the suffering in the world, if you misunderstand the broken, sinful condition of the world, and you try to explain the wickedness and the brokenness and the sin in the world apart from God's revelation of the person of Jesus and the solution on the cross, then you're not going to get it. Job's friends missed the point. Job wasn't suffering because of his personal sin. He was innocent and upright and righteous. He is living in a fallen world among wicked people. And it becomes a tiny little window that all of a sudden opens up to us as we begin to understand that that's exactly how Jesus lives. A righteous person in an unrighteous world. A person who never does anything wrong. He never says anything wrong. The only thing that he does is what's right and, and helpful and holy and edifying and encouraging. And what happens in a universe where a perfect person shows up and does everything right? How does mankind respond? They arrest him. They torture him and they kill him. Job's remarks, I'm going to suggest to you, are all of a sudden, again, not providing a complete answer to his own condition but as his journey of faith continues as his vision of God continues to expand and grow so does ours Warren Wiersbe writes quote in the east it wasn't enough for accused people to affirm their innocence they also felt compelled to call down the wrath of God on those who said they were guilty Job's words remind us of the imprecatory psalm, Psalm 58, Psalm 69, Psalm 137, in that they are a prayer for God's judgments on his enemies. Who are Job's enemies? Anybody who agreed with Job's three friends that he was guilty of sin, that he deserved to be punished by God. While this conversation had been going on, many people had gathered around the ash heap. They listened to the debate, and most of them probably sided with Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. Job could see the spectators nodding their heads in agreement with his friends. He knows that he's outnumbered, unquote. And you're living in a world where people will come upon you in your conversation as they say things about God and they say things about reality and you say stuff like, no, 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 God is good. No, God is kind. No, God is generous. No, God is, is righteous. No, the, the God of the Bible is a loving God, a gracious God, a merciful God, a tender God. He is a God who hates sin, but he loves sinners. No, the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible is a God who's made a way for people to be saved and reconciled to God. And when you point out, when people say, how do you know that? And you tell the gospel story, here in his love, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. They wonder whether or not it's true. 
And so Job's vision is the fate of the wicked. He's going to talk about their fate from verses 13 to to 23. In verse 13 he says, This is the portion of a wicked man with God and the heritage of oppressors received from the Almighty. And so he's going to begin to to give a series of things um, from verses 13 to verse 23. Some Bible teachers and scholars suggest that verses 13 through 23 belong as an addendum or an additional statement with Zophar, a part of a missing third speech. Some suggest that Job is quoting his friends or their former words. Some suggest that this is sort of an introduction, if you will, of what he said in verse 13, in verse um, 12. Where he makes the statement, meaningless words. Surely all of you have seen it. Why then do you behave with complete nonsense? Another translation is meaningless words. You've made all of this stuff up. And then some scholars think that what Job is doing is now quoting, like I would quote a particular person, and then he's going to address the quote. One commentary, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, suggests, quote, many scholars assign these words to Zophar because this would give him a third speech and because the words seem more consistent with him than with Job. It goes on. However, Job had already spoken of the fate of the wicked in chapter 24, verses 18 through 24. He never denied the ultimate punishment of God's enemies, but he did deny their immediate judgment contrary to Zophar's claim in chapter 20, verse 5, chapter 21, verse 7. If Zophar could speak of the fate of the wicked and their heritage, verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 29, so could Job, unquote. This is from chapter 27 of the Bible Knowledge Commentary. So very quickly, the wicked man dooms his children to die in verses 13 through 15. The wicked man will have no one to mourn him, not even his widow in verse 15. The wicked man will lose his possessions and wealth in verses 16 and 17. The wicked man will see the collapse and the total destruction of his house in verse 18. The wicked man will awaken one day to find everything gone. Verse 19. The wicked man will be terrorized, verses 20 through 23. So look again in verse 14. It says, if his children are multiplied, that means he has lots and lots of children. It is for the sword. In other words, the wicked may have lots and lots of kids, but it's going to end violently. This is an idiomatic expression. His children are multiplied for the sword. This is one thing, of a a way of saying... um, susceptible to violence and his offspring shall not be satisfied with bread one way of thinking about this is the wicked influence their children by the way do you think that's true do you think that if you grow up in a violent and abusive household that you might acquire some of the traits of violence and abuse Do you think it's possible that if you grow up in a world where a person is lazy and they don't work, or they're unemployed or underemployed, if you grow up in a world of poverty and you are introduced to poverty and your life is a life of poverty and you've lived a legacy of poverty, is it often passed on to the children? I think the answer is yes. This is Job's way of saying that immoral behavior is both taught and caught and that sometimes the children are multiplied for the sword. That means they're susceptible to violence today, today, today. A 16-year-old student in a high school in Pennsylvania took two kitchen knives and stabbed 20 of his classmates. Stabbed them in the chest, in the stomach, In the back, many of the children reported that they didn't even know they were being stabbed. All of a sudden, they just felt something 
painful. They, they felt a shooting pain. They felt something sharp. And then all of a sudden, they're covered with blood. In verse 15, it says, Those who survive him shall be buried in death, and their widows shall not weep. Why are they buried? Because they're dead. For the same reason that their father died. And this is the point that Job is making. The idea being people die sometimes a violent death. People die sometimes a shameful death. And by the way, when a person dies a shameful death, are they less likely to be mourned? Do you think people shed tears over Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold after they shot 13 of their classmates and a Columbine teacher. Do you think that the monster who went into the, or to the Aurora movie theater and then shot all of those people, including children, and injured more, do you think that if all of a sudden the news broke, he hung himself in the Arapahoe County Jail, do you think people are going to go, and I'm really sorry to hear that? Probably not. When you live a life of shame and you do shameful things, the chances are people aren't going to weep over you. And that's part of the point that he's making. There's a sense of relief and peace that sweep over families when they discover that a killer or a violent person has died. And then in verse 16, he says, though he heaps up silver like dust, he piles up clothing like clay. He may pile it up, but the just will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver. The, the implication being the wicked will be able to hoard wealth. They can get more. They can get more. They can accumulate more. They can get more money than they could ever spend. They can get more clothes than they, they could ever wear. And then they die. And somebody else spends their money. Somebody else wears their clothes. Remember what's happened. Was Job a wealthy man? Yes. Has he lost his wealth? Yes. Has he lost his health? Yes. His friends believe it's because of sin. But he's innocent. And Job points out, that it's possible for something terrible to happen to someone who's completely innocent. And of course it's possible that something terrible can happen to people who aren't so innocent. In verse 18 he says, He builds his house like a moth, like a booth, which a watchman makes. Now a moth builds a cocoon. But remember what every caterpillar that becomes a butterfly when they form the chrysalis, they break free of the chrysalis and they abandon the chrysalis. A booth which a watchman makes. The watchman that he's talking about is a person who's in a harvest or who's tending sheep. And imagine you're out in the desert somewhere or you're in some vast plain or you're harvesting some grain and you build a temporary booth or you have a, a shack or a tent or a temporary shelter. That's the point. The booth and the shack are meant to be temporary. Both are weak. Both are insecure. Neither lasts. They can't Provide a permanent place of security. And so that's part of the point that he's making of the wicked. That no matter how big the palace is and no matter how incredible their circumstances are, they can provide for themselves what they think is a fortress, but it's never going to be a permanent place of security because we're going to find out that everybody dies. The rich man will lie down but not be gathered up. He opens his eyes and he is no more. Job's hope isn't in his wonderful tents or his permanent dwelling places. Job has a new home. It's on an ash heap. Job understands that homes come and homes go. 
and that you might live in a great home and then you might be moved to an assisted living center and then you might be moved to a hospital room where everything that you possess is put in a drawer because that's all you have left. And then even that is gone. The rich man will lie down but not be gathered up. He opens his eyes and he is no more. This is his way of saying the wicked wake up one day and they discover everything's gone. They lie down in comfort. They lie down in security and assurance. They lie down content with everything that they have and then one day they wake up and everything is gone. He says in verse 20, terror overtakes them like a flood. A tempest steals them away in the night. The idea being that a terror and a disaster seizes the wicked like a tsunami or a hurricane or a storm. And the wicked try to escape the terror, but it pounds down like 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 something that has no mercy, like a volcano that erupts and the lava flows and it buries everyone underneath. It's like the side of a mountain that just all of a sudden comes crashing down in Washington, undifferentiating between the wicked and the righteous. The mud buries everyone that's in the way. Job's point The wicked will be overwhelmed by a terror at some point in their life. But even if they're not overwhelmed by a terror at some point in their life, they eventually will because they're they're going to eventually die. The east wind carries him away and he's gone. It sweeps him out of his place in verse 21. It hurls against him and does not spare. He flees desperately from its power. Men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place. In verse 23, when they would clap in the Middle East or they would hiss, it was their way of communicating, you don't belong here. You're not welcome here. You need to move on. You have no place here. And Job understands exactly what that means. He knows what it's like for someone to look at him and say, you know, um, you probably don't belong here. The wicked persist in their sin. They won't let it go. They refuse to give up their sin. The wicked won't ask God for forgiveness. And because they won't ask God for forgiveness, they won't receive forgiveness, even if it's extended. They refuse. They refuse. Jesus shows up and he knocks at the door and they say no. They go to a Bible study and they say no. They walk away over and over and over again. A deliverance is offered and they say no. Salvation is offered and they say no the wicked could even profess they could even confess they could even say that they trusted the Lord but everything in their life doesn't seem to indicate that they can say that they had an experience but they live their life they talk and walk as if it never happened they refuse to yield their lives to Jesus they refuse to believe and embrace God's word and the scripture and they leave no doubt To their own fate. Because they've lived a life. Of resistance. And rebellion. And disobedience. So that the only thing that's available to them is judgment. But you see this is the. This is the never ending story of the gospel. It's a constant reoccurring invitation that instead of rejecting Christ, instead of rejecting salvation, instead of rejecting judgment or salvation and and mercy and forgiveness, they accept judgment. And so we discover something. That even though Job 
calls down judgment on the wicked and those who falsely accuse him, that's not the New Testament model. You're a Christian. And because you're a Christian, you get to respond differently to abuse and persecution. You don't, get to, you don't seek vengeance. The Lord promises that he'll deal with the unjust, that he'll deal with the wicked. Our instructions are very different. In Matthew 5.39, it says, But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. In the ancient world, the way you ended a blood feud was by the law of retaliation. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a life for a life. Remember, in the ancient world, you kill someone in my family, I kill everyone in your family. And even then, they understood that that's not right. In Matthew 5.44, Jesus says that we're to love our enemies. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. In Romans chapter 12, it says, dearly beloved, don't avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. The, The meaning of that statement, give place to wrath, is Paul's way of saying, believe in such a thing It's God's justice and judgment. This is Paul's way of saying, believe with all of your heart that God is in the business of making everything right. He writes, see that none render evil for evil to any man, but everyone should do that which is good among you. Be kind to all men in 1 Thessalonians 5.15. We bless those who do evil against us, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. That means bad speech. But on the contrary, blessing. Again, Warren Wiersbe, quote, In fact, God was the only one who could prove Job was right and his enemies were wrong. Where else could Job turn for help? This is an important statement that Wiersbe makes. God was the only person who could prove the truth about what was going on in Job's life and what was going on in Job's heart and what was going on in Job's mind. And it might be, there might come a time, there might become a time in your life where everyone thinks they know what's going on with you. But no one knows, except for God. That only God knows the exact truth about what's going on in your mind and what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your circumstances. So Job is in effect pleading He's saying, Lord, you're the only one who understands me. You're the only one who gets me. You're the only one who has complete knowledge and information in order to explain my circumstances. And so where else can I go for help? To whom else can I turn? Job is asking the question, why am I suffering? Why is this happening to me? And we've already begun to at least discover at least something. We've discovered that people don't always suffer for their sins, do they? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we suffer because of something someone else has done. Joseph was thrown into a pit and then sold into slavery. Not because of something he did, but because of something his wicked brothers did out of jealousy. Sometimes we suffer, apparently, to keep us from sin. Sometimes the tire will go flat at exactly the right moment so that you don't get to drive to the place where you was hoping you would be. Sometimes things turn out in such a way to prevent you from ruining and destroying your own life. And it's possible to suffer for no good reason in the sense that 
Did Jesus suffer ever? The answer is yes. Did Jesus ever suffer because he himself did something wrong? He never did anything wrong. The Bible begins to make it abundantly clear that sometimes we want an explanation more than we want the Lord. Remember what I've already told you and that I'll continue to tell you. Will Job really have his question answered? Why is this happening to me? The answer is no. When we come to the end of the book, the answer, I'm already going to tell you the answer. The answer is going to be that God's going to show up. And when the Lord shows up, then all of a sudden, the answer's to Job's questions become less and less important as he begins to understand the full and significant meaning of what it means to have friendship and relationship with God. Remember, at this point, the righteous appear to be everybody who does what God wants. And the wicked are everyone who does what God doesn't want. But then we discover something in the New Testament and that there's none good. No, not one. That we all can perfectly and appropriately fit under the category of the wicked. So what's the solution to our problem? Jesus becomes the solution to our problem. He saves us from our sin. He forgives us and reconciles us. Does God hate the wicked? Yeah. Does God have a cure for wickedness? It's, yeah, it's salvation. It's faith in Christ. And now the problem is solved. But that's for another time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, as we continue Job's conversation, and Lord, as we anticipate what he's going to talk about in chapter 28, he's going to look for answers. He's going to search for answers, just like we do. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we would discover that wisdom comes when we understand the things of God, the love of God, the revelation of God. That, Lord, we have a, a foundation as we trust the sovereignty of God and the Son of God and the salvation that's provided by God. And so again, Lord, I pray that you would provide comfort, hope, wisdom, as we continue to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.